Hi, I'm Daniela Kirk from Generation to Generation, and I'm here to interview and introduce you to Daphne Kirk, who is the founder of Generation to Generation, and who coincidentally also happens to be my mum. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> Would you like to share a little bit about what Generation to Generation is and what the vision is? Yeah, the vision of Generation to Generation is to see the next generation equipped, empowered, and prepared for such a time as this. I mean, literally for such a time as this. But more than that, to go back to what the Bible says and how the Bible says we should raise them and who's responsible. And what, are, what does the Bible say? Well, as far as we can see, the Bible only says two things and only gives two principles. And we've traveled to, what, over 40 nations? Sure. And everywhere we go, people don't seem to know what these two principles are. So how about you tell us? Right, the first one <laughs> is that one whole generation is responsible for the next, which we addressed in a previous program. But today I think the agenda is to talk about the second principle, which is that parents are responsible for the discipleship of their children. Uh oh. So how would you say that you are responsible for the discipleship of me? Well, all the time I've been, when we've been traveling, we have done pastors conferences, leaders conferences, consultations, we have worked with churches and organizations. But I know that the whole time I kept as my primary focus the care of you and your brother <laughs> and the discipleship of you and your brother. Um, I always put you first and made sure that ministry never, ever, ever came before you. Great. So where would you say that those principles are in the Bible? Well, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to God and the revealed things belong to you and your children. And as I understand it from that scripture, everything that God has given a parent belongs to them and their children. Now, you've seen us in conferences. We have a parent and a child on the platform and I give the father usually, a piece of chocolate. And I say, this belongs to you and your child. And then because we have primed the father beforehand, he eats the whole of the chocolate. And everybody is usually in a riot, aren't they? Of course, it's Be his chocolate. <laughs> because he, the father ate the chocolate that I said belonged to him and his child. And then when everybody has calmed down, we replay that and we take the Bible and I put it behind my back and I say, the secret things belong to God. What was hidden belongs to God. But the things that he reveals, everything in his word, every testimony, everything he gives us belongs to you and your child. And so we point out that while people are horrified that the father has stolen the chocolate from the child, generally speaking, there isn't a horror in the body of Christ that parents are stealing from their children what God entrusted them to give. Okay, and, and that's incredibly interesting. Now, you gave at the beginning the examples of how you disciple, say, me or my brother, mm. and we were traveling with you, but you could say, well, we were traveling with you, so going to a local church every Sunday may have been difficult, um, but would you not say the local church is responsible for the spiritual discipleship of their children? Well, I believe the local church plays a part but that is not who the Bible makes primarily responsible. I think what has happened in the church is that generally people have come to the opinion that I'm a good parent if I take my child to children's ministry. I'm a good parent, especially if in teenage years I still get my teenager to the youth department. And somehow we've built into our thinking that that's what the Bible says but I haven't seen it in the Bible. <laughs> and so I believe that the church is there to add a dynamic that the parents can't, but not to do the job of the parents. Now, before everybody blames <laughs> the church, because usually pe parents, usually churches say, well, the parents won't do it. Mm -hmm. But I would say we have a culture in the church which actually disempowers parents. And in what way would they do that? Shall I give a few silly examples? On, a few silly examples, but I think they're huge. So you may have children's ministry going on at the same time as the Sunday service, which is a usual pattern and absolutely fine. And then supposing in children's ministry a child wants to give their life to Jesus, then the children's ministry would lead them to Jesus, right? Yeah. Absolutely. But why? 
when the parents are sitting in the other room, would they lead that child to Jesus and rob the parents of the most important moment in that child's life? And so we say to churches, why aren't you saying to the child, wait till mummy and daddy comes and let them lead you to Jesus? Or even go and get the parents out of the service and say, your child wants to give their life to Jesus, come, you lead them. So the culture of the church generally disempowers parents, as we have seen. But what if the parent doesn't know how to do that? Funny you should ask that <laughs> question. We've heard that everywhere we go. That's one of the first questions that comes out of people's um, mouths is, but parents don't know how to disciple their children. We have a great story to tell about that one. <laughs> so we were in Brazil and we had five, six, seven thousand pastors and leaders. And one topic that they'd asked me to speak on was the discipleship of their children. So especially when it's a different language, I like to do something that connects me with them. And so as a kind of icebreaker, I said to them, how many of you like soccer? Well, this is Brazil. So they're all jumping up and down saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Brazilians are very, very bubbly. So then I said to them, how many of you have children who also like soccer? Well, now the place is going crazy. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I said to them, how many of you have children who support the same soccer team as you? And now everybody's calling out different soccer teams and I won't on television say the one we support, but it's <laughs> Manchester United, right? <laughs> so Andrew was shouting Manchester United and the whole place was in an uproar. Now, when it had calmed down, I said to them, now to get on to the topic, you have asked me to talk about the discipleship of your children. Mm. Why? Because you all know how to disciple your children. You did it with football. And the place went very, very quiet. Do you nice. remember? Mm. Really quiet. And I could see the leaders in the front look down and everybody <laughs> look at their neighbour. Because the truth is they had all discipled their children in football. Mm. Now, I have never met a father who's had to go to a class to be taught how to disciple their son in football. Nobody had to inspire them. They just did it. How did they do it? They talked about it when they got up in the morning. They talked about it when they walked along the road. They put the posters on the wall, the hats on, the bands on, the t-shirts on. They talked about it when they go to bed. It sounds like a scripture, I know. It sounds like a scripture <laughs> we know in Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. which God said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, talk about it when you get up with your children, when you walk along the road, etc., etc. Why did they do that? Well, Deuteronomy also says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and spill it all over your children. Because when you have passion, you talk about it. When you get up, you talk about it along the road. It just bubbles out of you. So that isn't a method, it's an outworking of passion. So what it sounds like you're saying, if I hear you right, is we've lost our passion for Jesus. Yes. And if we were passionate about Jesus, the discipleship would come almost easily. Exactly. Anybody with passion spills it over other people. You know, when I'm, I meet a lot of people on a day-to-day -day basis, and if I want to get somebody to talk, I ask them what they're passionate mm -hmm. about, and boom, they're off. So the Bible says, write it on your heart and tell it to your children. It's not that it's meant to be in our heads and we beat it with them, them with it, but it's in our heart. We spill it on them. And children, anybody, catches passion. Yeah, and, and I get that because I would say actually one of the things I've learned most from you is your passion for God. It is your passion for Jesus. Mm. And, you know, I've, learnt, I've seen you as you've lived your life. You know, you've given God everything. When you're upset, you go to God when we're uncertain, you've called us together to pray about certain things when, if for instance we haven't had money for something, you've gathered us together and said, okay guys, come on, let's pray. Um, and your lifestyle has reflected how much you love Jesus and that is difficult not to catch. Um, so I can see that being played out, absolutely. So the really sad news and I think the desperate news is, do we have 
a generation of parents, and let me say I know that there are parents who are discipling their children, I don't want to make it sound like all of them, but generally as we travel through any nation, in any culture, we see that parents have abdicated responsibility to the church. Could it be that we have a generation of parents who are more passionate about education, about music, about soccer, whatever, more passionate than they are about their love for Jesus. Mm. And that is the real, real sad thing. This is not about children or parents. It's actually about a love for Jesus. Mm. I have yet to meet a parent who is passionately in love with Jesus, who is not putting the discipleship of their children absolute primary. Mm. Now, I'm going to say something that you've heard me say, and when this is said, often people think that I've said the wrong thing. But I actually consider myself one of the most selfish parents on the planet. Okay. <laughs> and I did say selfish, yes. right? Explain that. Explain that. You see, I do not want to stand before God one day and receive my crown and look around and my children aren't there. Mm. I don't want that. What I want is to see all of you come receive the great well done and I will be shouting, yes, that was my child, that's my kid, they're getting their crown. That's what my goal is for you. Um, that's what my goal is, is for all my children and that's what I want to see. And so I know I've taken that word selfish really into <laughs> another level, but I don't want that. I don't want to spend eternity. I don't want to stand before the throne of God and my children not be there. I don't want to look into the eyes of Jesus and see the pain in his eyes because my child wasn't there. I don't want him to look at me and say, welcome Daphne, what happened to your children? And I think what happens with so many parents is they don't have an eternal perspective. They, they want to see their children equipped for this earth, they want to see them with a good education. Nothing wrong with that, I was a teacher. Okay. Um, they want to see them have a, a job with money, they have earthly goals, but I say to parents, look 200 years from now, what do you want for your children? They're so short-sighted, and if we love our children, surely we're more concerned about the next billion years than we are the next 70. Sure. Otherwise, how can that be love for our children? That makes perfect sense, what you're saying. Um, one of the things... Um I think our listeners may be thinking though is passion is very vague it's an emotion it's something that is kind of out there like are you a passionate person what are you passionate about that kind of mm -hmm. thing um, so the application is a bit vague okay so if there was a parent saying oh gosh you know I, I love Jesus maybe I'm not a passionate person maybe I thought I was. Can you give some examples of what that might look like? At, at the beginning you shared about how you were almost intentional with us in our discipleship. So what could that look like for a parent who wants some first steps to get going? Yeah, passion is expressed in different ways. But usually, um, let me give you some examples of it. Okay. Our priorities with our children will reflect our passion. Now I'm a bubbly person. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to be bubbly. Well. It, <laughs> you, it, but if what I'm intentional about, what I focus on, what I talk to my children about, what I insist on, will be a reflection of my passion. So if I'm really, really passionate about education and about getting a good education, I'll be taking interest in their, their homework, I'll be going up to the school and checking on, their, checking on their grades, I will be focused on their education. If I am passionate about Jesus, I will be focused on their walk with him. What is going on in their lives in relation to them? I wouldn't want them to be connected to the body of Christ. I will be wanting to share his word with them. My talking to them will be about Jesus, not out of law, not like, this is time to talk about it. I mean, you never get your children interested in football by saying, come, let's sit down and discuss <laughs> football. But it's the lifestyle of talking and sharing because it comes from a high priority in my life. So how it is expressed will be different, but you can be sure whatever parents are passionate about or is their high interest is what they will be focusing on their children on. Yeah. 
And would you say this is from a certain age or until a certain age? I would say it's from conception onwards. Okay. <laughs> and we have always gone before our children. I mean, there isn't an age in the Bible where we suddenly abdicate responsibility for our children. We've always gone ahead of them, the older women with the younger women. You know, I sometimes say to parents, we are there to lead the way and to show the way till the day we die. And even then we show them how to do it. <laughs> That's a good quote. I like that. Okay, so if I was to apply this to teenagers, mm -hmm. um, there's almost that expectancy of teens are going to rebel, they're going to go through that difficult stage. So there might be some parents now that go, I can't talk to my kids, my, my teenagers or that won't listen to me. The, you know, surely this is then the responsibility of the church or what can they do? Well, I do think that in teenagers, the input of other people is a great asset in life. And I know with you uh, and with your brother, mm -hmm. I was very intentional about having other people in your life to make an input so that it was just wasn't about me. Um, but I think spending time with them and taking an interest in what interests them. Now, it's an, I have to step into your generation and step into what is going on in your life, not expect you always to come to mine. So maybe I'll give an example with Andrew and the hip-hop. I was just thinking that, so I'm glad you volunteered it. <laughs> so I think music often separates, well, it always separates generations. And Andrew liked hip-hop, and uh, I was determined if he was going to like hip-hop, it was going to be Christian hip-hop. So he said to me once, well, you you find good Christian hip-hop and I'll listen to it. Mm -hmm. So I went on a search until I found some and brought it to him and, and he actually liked it, which was a great relief. You said you went on a search and found some. Does that mean you actually listened to some? I actually listened <laughs> to some. I took advice from people I knew. I looked on the internet. I was very intentional about finding it. Then when he had it, I could have just given it to him and walked away. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't hear the words. I didn't know what it was saying. <laughs> so I would sit with him and I would read through the words and he would talk to me about it and I'd ask him questions and he educated me in what good Christian hip-hop was and what wasn't good Christian hip-hop until in the end he would come to me and say, what do you think of this? I said, yeah, I think that's good. And I, I would actually be on the same wavelength as him. Nice. Now, Did I, you like hip-hop before this? No, I didn't, but I do now. <laughs> and I actually think Christian hip-hop has some of the most hard-hitting lyrics out and there are some of Andrew's friends now who are rappers who actually call me mum. Oh, but I think that is an example of where we have to connect with where our teenagers are at, bring Jesus into where they're at and walk alongside them where too often we're just trying to drag them out of who God created them to be instead of giving them the freedom and the vision to be who God created them to be and us walking into it with them. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense and I think you've given some really practical advice um, which will help people who are coming in and going, okay, you're telling me it's my responsibility and almost life is full of all these classes of how to and what to do for any aspect of a child's life but probably the spiritual one. I know some churches put on parenting classes and things like that, but not every church does. Mm. Um, so for those who are listening who have no idea, and this is a new concept to them, I think you've given some really great advice. I think these parenting classes, etc., are great, wonderful tools, but what usually happens mm. is that the ones who are already interested go. <laughs> And I actually think it gets far, far deeper than that. You see, I think parents discipling their children is a biblical doctrine. It's not a topic. It's not an idea. It's a doctrine that runs right through the Bible, way down to Timothy, who's discipled by his mother and his grandmother. It's right through the Bible. And it's a culture that has been lost from the churches. For example, a pastor will preach and he will say, if God has impacted your life today, amen, go and tell someone. But the Bible says, the first people you tell are your children. So should we not be saying, if God has impacted your life today, go and tell your children. Or we may be in a small group and somebody has a testimony and we will share the testimony, amen. But nobody says, have you told your children? You see, they're bringing that chocolate and sharing it with the, the group before they've shared it with their children. Or another example, you know, I may go to my small group and say, oh, I've got a bad back. 
and um, we, everybody prays for it, yeah? Absolutely, yeah. But nobody says, have your children prayed for your back or have your family prayed for your back? You go home and get your family to pray and then we'll agree with the prayers of your family. So you're saying God can use children to pray and to, they can hear God? Totally. I sometimes think that we, you know, with the story of Balaam's ass, that people have more faith to believe that the ass could speak God's word than they do children. You see, I don't think it's an insult to the child when we say they can't be used. I think it's an insult to God. You know, it's like, oh God, you're not capable of sort of getting in a body that's that high. You're not capable of speaking through a child. It's a real insult to God if we're not prepared to hear him through a child. One of my favourite stories you share about a child hearing God involves um, one of the children we know who wasn't a Christian. Could you share that story? Yes, there was, uh, God wants to speak to everybody. That's how we come to him. And there was this boy, he was eight, nine, and he was standing in our house, never been to church, family unchurched, and I said to him, Tommy, that wasn't his name, but that's sure. different now, Tommy, ask Jesus how much he loves you, and he went like this, I know, and I said, what did he say? And he said, he said, he told me he loves me more than I need water. Hmm. You know, we could stop the program now <laughs> yeah, and think of that. Incredible. God speaks to children, but until parents are convicted in their own heart of the biblical command on their life to pass on to their children, we're not going to get a cultural change. It's not going to come by a class, it has to come in an anointing of the word of God from the senior leadership of the church and parents brought to a deep repentance. You see, if it is a command to pass on to our children and we disobey, it's called sin. And yet I have seen hardly any churches where parents are brought to repentance for committing the sin of disobeying this command of God. And I think it's from that place of repentance, of the rhema word of God, and of seeing the tremendous responsibility God put on them when he entrusted them with a the child. From that place come the parenting classes, etc., and the tools to help them do it. Always bearing in mind that if you're passionate about Jesus, there's not going to be much mm -hmm. trouble with how you pass it on. That's very true. All the way along, you've talked about this biblical command, and I know generation to generation is based on scripture. Um, you've given a couple of scriptures throughout, but would you be able to share a little bit more about this biblical command? Yes, I mean, we said about the Deuteronomy 1, when you get up, when you walk along the road, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You know, when, um, when the children of Israel passed through the wilderness, all the time God was saying, okay, lay these memorials so that when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? You will tell them what God did. That the memorials that God asked us to put in place were so that we would tell our children. I know with Joshua, when he called the people together, there's the men, the women, the children, the babes in arms. The families came together before God and, and they heard what Joshua said. They heard the, the reprimands of God in, in the desert. They were all there together in it. And I think it is time once more for families to become the DNA of the church, for parents to be discipling their children and to bring those children to the body of Christ who forms them in an army to go out and win a lost generation. Mm, very good. You, can you help churches implement this? Is this something that generation to generation does? Absolutely. Invite us to come. We will come with our inspiration. We will come with our passion. But most of all, we will come with the Word of God. Because I think mostly people haven't actually seen what it is in the Word of God. And, um, and we will come and help. We will come and help with the culture of the church. We don't come in to try and change structures that ruins the church, but we will come in and help the culture of the church to change in small ways to bring about that transformation. Wonderful. I'm gonna do a little plug. So you have written quite a few books. Quite a few books. Of which, oh, sorry, if I stop the mic. Um, of which I'm a big fan, but I'm a little bit biased because I'm your daughter. 
<laughs> but um, these are two foundational books, so tell me about these books. Right. Reconnecting the Generations is a book I actually wrote for pastors and leaders to preach from. It's Bible, Bible, Bible. On every page is different scripture. So that is the absolute biblical foundations of why we need the generations connected um, and what the Bible has to say. It. And then Born for Such a Time as This is kind of the inspirational book that stands on top of Reconnecting the Generations. It says, Raising a Passionate Generation of Children and Young People for Jesus. And that's what it's all about. Jesus paid a price for this generation. This generation is facing some of the hardest times the world has ever known. As parents, we have a responsibility preparing them and for raising our children and young people for Jesus in such a time as this to change this world for him. Awesome. So if anyone wants to know more, these would be some really good places yeah, to start. on our website. Do you have any other books that would help? I know you have a Living with Jesus set which helps with discipleship. Can you tell me a bit about yes. that? Yes. The, the Living with Jesus are some discipleship books, not Bible reading, not devotions, but will actually help parents in the discipleship and the relationship with their children. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you for joining us. Um, you've got to hear an incredible message with Generation to Generation. And you've heard where, the books that you can read to find out more. And the website is www.reconnectingthegenerations.com. Do check them out. Do check out their message. And we'll see you next time.